Thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Gervais. Uh, I'm the owner of Heartland International English School, which is a private language school here in Winnipeg. And, uh, but I'm here tonight representing the Manitoba Council for International Education, uh, which is the industry association for uh, international education in Manitoba. Um, and I, I guess one, I know the focus post secondary here, so uh, just to apologize in advance, I'm, uh, I'll be talking mostly international education in general, so if it feels like it's not exactly post secondary, uh, the Manitoba Council for International Education represents universities, uh, high schools, public, private, uh, language schools, French programs, English programs. So anyone who's essentially interested in recruiting international students to come to Manitoba is involved in this organization. So if I'm kind of taking a broader approach, that's why that's what our organization represents. Uh, what I hope to do tonight is uh, start off with giving um, some context in the, uh, the, what I think is the global um, operating world of international education and what's happening out there, not just happening in Manitoba. Um, I'm coming from the standpoint of how to grow it. I know that necessarily might not necessarily be um, where this topic goes, but our organization is really about growing international education. So I'm going to talk about the opportunities or uh, challenges in that. Uh, I will touch on the one question in the synopsis around uh, Canadian students studying abroad and maybe why that doesn't happen more. Uh, and some challenges overall with international education and finally try and look at what I think is probably the most important thing is answering the question why because if we don't really start with why then I think we kind of get bogged down in the, in the reads a little bit. Uh, so first off to start with the context and the big picture, uh, Manitoba right now is approximately 8,000 uh, international students studying in Manitoba. Uh, from an economic standpoint that represents about 230 million dollars a year to the Manitoba economy. Uh, it's a major industry that really flies under the radar. Most people don't know about it. It's on par in Manitoba or exceeding things like bus manufacture, for example. Uh, yet because it's an education service export, uh, it just, and it mostly operates in the public sphere, we just don't really hear about this major industry in Manitoba. Uh, and in fact, it's responsible for the creation of uh, slightly below 2,000 jobs, so, or supports 2,000 jobs a year. So very significant industry that um, you know, unless you're in the world, probably don't know about it. Um, Manitoba is doing well, but in comparison to the rest, rest of Canada, we're below our average. Uh, we only have 2.7% of the international students in Canada, um, with our population being whatever, 3.2, 3.3, so we're, um, we're not punching our weight, so to speak. Uh, in comparison to Nova Scotia, which has a smaller population, has 3.6% of international students in Canada. So a province, you know, somewhat comparable is doing much better than we are. Uh, in the Canadian context, um, 2013 numbers, which are the most recent, say there's 294,000 international students in Canada, representing an $8 billion economic impact to the, uh, to the Canadian economy. Uh, again, in comparables, um, it's bigger than softwood lumber. We all hear about softwood lumber, we rarely ever hear about international education. Uh, Canada, again, there is doing well, but in comparison, um, we're the, you know, a lot of countries are doing better than us in international education. Uh, we're number seven in the rankings. Uh, US, UK, China, France, Germany, and Australia um, attract more international students than Canada does. Uh, obviously, the US, with its high profile universities and um, larger population, everything, we can understand places like that, UK, US, doing better. So, Australia is probably the best comparable for us. Um, in, in terms of, you know, their education system, but also, uh, you know, population-wise and things like this. Um, but Australia, with two-thirds of our population, uh, the industry is a $16 billion a year industry. So in essence, they're doing three times better than we are in international education. Um, why are they doing so much better? Well, they're probably about 20 years ahead of us in this industry is one of, probably the biggest factor. Um, the fact that education in Australia is a federal department probably plays a lot into it, and um, they've marketed it really well. Um, I don't think, and from everything I've read, it's not because their education system is better or they're offering a better service. <laughs> uh, it's simply these marketing and other factors that are playing into it. So, um, though, you know, I don't want to go too much into numbers globally, but it kind of shows you where we're positioned in Manitoba, that we're, we're doing well, and we're doing well in Canada, but it's a very competitive, global world in terms of international education and any sort of policy we develop here is really affected by that competitiveness that's happening in all these other countries. Uh, so taking the um, um, thesis of growing it, <laughs> uh, so how do we grow it? So I, I think the most important thing starting off 
is recognizing it as a sector and having, um, if we as a province are um, uh, dedicated to growing this industry in Manitoba, and the provincial government's come on and said that, uh, then I think we have to really recognize it as an industry sector. And I know in education it's really hard to sometimes to think of uh, education as business, but the reality is is that it's a, a export service business that we're competing around the world with. Um, I think one of the other keys is um, support at all levels, just not the university levels. Although the university really drives international education, um, you know, the presidents of universities have the year of government. It's really hard for anyone else in uh, the education sector to have that strong a voice at the government table. Um, but the fact is, is that the K-12 sector supports international education and that those students will go through high school and move into our universities. Um, our English and French language program supports students coming in who don't have that skills to study in our uh, universities. Um, the colleges play a big role, and um, I think there's a role for both private and public uh, within this. Um, of course, key to all of this is providing a good quality service. Uh, if we're not pro uh, providing a service that the rest of the world wants to buy, you know, we're gonna be in trouble. Um, I think we're doing well in that. Canada does well in international education. We have a good product. Um, and, and that's the other point, I think, is that we really have to recognize the quality that we have. Um, you know, when I travel around the world and meet with other people in other education systems, you come to realize how strong of an education system we do have in Canada. And I think we have to recognize and celebrate that to promote it. Um, so one of the keys, I think, uh, in this is explaining the Canadian system. And when I'm around the world marketing, one of the things that I often hear is people want to know the rankings, right? And rankings in Canada aren't nearly as important as they are in the countries. I worked in Japan for three years. And at elementary school level, they were already focusing on, you know, the testing that they do in junior high school to get into the right high school, to get into the right university. Because if you don't get into the one of the top three universities, it shuts out a whole bunch of jobs to you. So there's a lot of pressure, and you know, this model is quite common in Asia, whether it be in Korea or China. Um, there's a lot of pressure to get into the right university, and that sets you up for life. Whereas our Canadian system is more about, you know, it's more egalitarian, and more about how well you do at university. And I often use the example when I'm abroad, um, I have a law degree, and um, my classmates who did really well, I wasn't one of them, um, you know, they got the, the Supreme Court clerkships, you know, the top two or three students, and it didn't matter so much which university, you don't have to go to the University of Toronto to get to the Supreme Court. You know, you have to do well in your program. And that's very different than other parts of the world. In Japan, university is very much seen as, you know, four years of having fun because you did all the hard work in high school to get to the right university. And now it's about making connections as opposed to actual learning. So I think we need to do a lot better work in explaining our Canadian system is one of the keys. Um, I think we ex need to ex uh, accept the role that private has to play. Um, and this is one of the reasons that Australia is doing a lot better than us is they've um, putting good systems in place to ensure high quality private programs. And going back to my point about um, university presidents, uh, the universities do have to lead this, I believe. As a, although it's a multi-sector or you know, multi-levels of education involved, um, the universities are often the drivers because they've got the year of government and they're the ones that are um, you know, influencing policy the most, I think. Uh, flipping over to the question about um, Canadians studying abroad, and why they don't do it. Um, and this is more my personal experience than any sort of uh, empirical research, but uh, I, one is that we don't have a culture of it. A lot of other countries do have a culture of sending people abroad to go study. You know, we don't, we rarely leave our city or province to study at university, let alone going halfway around the world. At least in the United States, they have a culture of going to a different city, or even if they're in the same city, living on residence. But, so we have a very different culture of that here. Uh, I think language is a big issue. A lot of uh, international students are coming to Canada or to English-speaking countries because of the university degree, but also to learn a language, to be proficient in English. Um, and also different pressures, and this is kind of what I touched on before, uh, with respect to pressures to get into university. We just don't have those same kind of pressures that they have in other countries. So those students who don't get into the top universities, studying abroad becomes a really attractive option because you can get a high-quality education um, without going to one of those top universities. Um, the only solution I can sort of think of uh, or that I've seen in terms of this getting more Canadian students to study abroad, I was a school trustee with Louis Grail School Division for eight years and um, as we increased our numbers of international students coming into the school division, 
uh, we were up to about 100 students, I think, when I, we left, when I left. And um, we were, um, that year, our profit, profit from it was about three to $400,000. And we were channeling some of that into sending some of our students back to Japan. Now, we got a new superintendent that came in and didn't like the fingerprints of anything on the old superintendent and sort of kind of killed that program. But that's political dirt. I'm probably not supposed to share it. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not on board anymore. <laughs> Okay, got two minutes, good. Uh, so I think some of the challenges in this, uh, the public system, um, and again, these are my personal opinions, uh, you know, it's, it's operating from that scarcity model and fighting for budgets. Um, and I th again, you know, the, not a criticism, but you know, big institutions are slow to change. And this is where the private comes in, and I think it's helpful because um, the private can drive a lot of innovation. Of course, our federal, uh, federal provincial uh, reality with education being a provincial um, responsibility in Canada's challenge because uh, we're trying to promote Canada as a brand but Canadian government really isn't supposed to be in this scene so there's a bit of a tug of war there. Um, in Manitoba uh, the International Education Act has come out and um, Manitoba is the first one to come out with it. It's a, a very good idea. You know the key points of it are supporting um, education and providing qual ensuring quality for international students and student protection. These are sort of the key things of the act. Um, my one criticism is that there's a bit of misunderstanding about how the industry works, and this goes back to my uh, comment about recognizing it as a sector, is that um, there's, there's two things, one, one in the, um, with how students are recruited and not necessarily understanding that and sort of putting a damper on the efforts of student recruitment agencies, um, and then this kind of all, again, favoring public over private. Um, the private vocational institutions have basically been shut out of international education in Manitoba. Um, and so, finally, going to my why, why do we need to be looking at international education? Um, number one is dem declining demographics. Uh, sitting on the school board, we look at the numbers from grade 12 to kindergarten, is basically a straight down line down in declining demographics. So, I think really universities have two choices, and I think this is a for debate, obviously, but it's either get smaller or recruit internationally. I think those are really the two only options. Uh, if international is, education is done right, um, I think it creates better institutions for us. It brings all that um, diversity into our programs. Um, not just you know, not just the finances in, that's an important part, but the academics I think are important as well. Um, Manitoba, we're not you know, on par with what we should. The Canadian government came out and said they want to double international education, uh, international student numbers by 2022 or 2020. Um, and uh, if Manitoba even keeps pace with that and get, gets our fair share, it's a difference between now and then of $1.5 billion to the Manitoba economy. So I think, you know, I think the, as I said in education, we're reluctant to talk about the money, but I think we have to realize that there is a huge opportunity for us to be had to sell what we have as essentially a world-class service. Um, there's a the whole immigration thing and students being a pathway to immigration and the uh, federal government's recognizing that more and more and we're moving along nicely with that. Um, and then, um, you know, as far as the uh, why on the students going abroad, you know, it's a more and more global economy and um, the, our students need those international experiences in order to compete in that global world. And, um, you know, our advantages in the past is that we're Canada and we speak English or French and that opens a lot of doors for you, but the rest of the world's catching up with that. So I think in order to have those experiences and understand the world, I think it's important for us to be making sure we're internationalizing that way as well. Great, thank you very much, uh, Gary.